In this video, we're checking out the Tycoon Max from Kaiwu 3D, a relatively new 3D printing company on the scene, which successfully kickstarted the Tycoon late 2020. It's a refreshing take on a desktop 3D printer with a lot to like, but it's certainly not perfect. In fact, I rewrote this entire review after going back to retest, and I retested a lot because they're a new company who deserves some constructive feedback. So, let's get started. How's it going guys? Angus here from Makers Muse. Usually when I review 3D printers on this channel, a company reaches out to me and I say, yeah, sure, I'll check it out. But in this case, I reached out to Kaiwu 3D because this very young company had already had their design cloned before they've even had a chance to get established. That's just not cool. The Tycoon and Tycoon Max are two sizes of the same design, which is i3-ish in design, but it's more heavily built than the Ender 3 style printers currently dominating the market. It arrived well packaged in foam with some tools and parts, a mini roll of white PLA, and a very good manual. You bolt the two assemblies together with four bolts from the bottom, which is actually pretty tricky to do with such a large and heavy unit. I got them finger tight and then I balanced it on its side precariously to tighten them further. It's not ideal, but I did feel it was safer than balancing it off the edge of a table. I honestly see no reason the bolts can't go from the top piece down, which would greatly improve the assembly experience. There's a few cable ties and shipping protections to remove, then once that's done, you plug in a few stepper and limit switch wires, as well as the print bed cable, which is a genuine XT60, nice to see, but it just kind of flops down on the table. We'll revisit that later in the video. The spool holder bolts onto the V-slot aluminium any way you like, and although this machine is primarily constructed from that material, none of the axes actually use it for motion, which is kind of weird, it almost blows my mind. Instead, they've gone with linear rods for the Y axis and Z with dual lead screws, synced with a belt running under the printer, and a nice linear rail for X with accurate, smooth motion. The choice to not use rollers in a design made from V-slot is really odd, um, and you might think that eight millimeter hardened rods are super stiff, but is actually quite a bit of deflection when they're spread across such a long unsupported distance. And this design honestly makes little sense to use them. I would have just used the V-slot with the rollers. Overall though, the frame is combined with sheet steel for an incredibly rigid design. The Tycoon series comes in several flavors, with this one being the larger Max version, sporting a print volume of 300 by 300 by 220 in the Z, with a single direct drive extruder, and that all too familiar coated glass print bed held in place with clips. If dual color or material printing is more of your thing, they've actually got an IDEX version as well, which looks pretty interesting. The interface is a little confusing, I'll be honest. Uh, if we've got this MKS base color touchscreen LCD up front with a full size SD slot on the side, that's actually only used to update the display. Instead, you load your models into the printer through this tiny micro SD card slot on the side, and the gap is wide enough to easily lose the card if you miss into the machine. I haven't encountered that issue since the Wanhao Duplicator i3 back in 2015, and it really should have a USB slot in my opinion, especially if the Artillery Sidewinder X2 can manage it with the same sort of interface. I actually checked out that machine recently. If you're interested, you can find the card here or find the link in the video description to go check it out. But just like the X2, the Tycoon Max has the quality of life features we've come to expect these days, such as filament runout detection, power loss recovery, and mesh bed leveling. The filament runout sensor is situated just above the hot end, so if it does run out, good luck with drawing it. <laughs> There's no way to get to it, um, and it will just sort of get stuck. The print bed is, again, now that all too familiar ultra base style glass, and it holds prints down pretty well, but it must be hot to work, around 60 degrees Celsius or so for PLA, and the parts do pop free when it cools, which is usually super handy, except if the power goes out, because you only have a limited window for it to come back on, for the prints to stay stuck down because if it cools too much, they're gone. And also, I'm just, I'm not really a fan of this surface. It's really sensitive to dust and oils from your fingernails. So I wipe it down with isopropyl alcohol and a paper towel. And I've noticed it's actually taking away this yellowish residue with it. 
I have no idea if it's left over from the manufacturing process or some kind of additional surface release agent, but it just doesn't stick stuff down as well as it should. I think that's partly the surface's fault, but also partly the bed heater's fault because it seems to be very underpowered, taking ages to even reach 60 degrees Celsius, which you need for PLA prints. And I've had a few PLA prints start to lift free from it, which is almost unheard of for 3D printers these days. But that mesh bed leveling is pretty neat. You might be surprised to see that this machine has no bed adjustment, no screws, knobs, and springs, and nothing like that. Instead, Kaiwu 3D have hard mounted it in place and put all of their faith in the mesh leveling provided by a BL Touch style probe. As long as the frame is very nearly trammed from assembly to the print surface, I'm okay with that, but do keep in mind that mesh bed leveling is a compromise of print accuracy. It can't magically flatten a warped print bed, it just compensates for it. The routine samples 16 points and takes a few minutes to complete and then you're good to go. It saves it to EEPROM and doesn't need to be run again unless you move the printer or update the firmware. Just make sure to baby step the Z-axis for a perfect first layer because the probe isn't gonna figure that out for you. You gotta do that yourself. I've been comparing this machine a fair bit to the Siderunner X2, but that machine doesn't have Wi-Fi. And this machine does, sort of. The implementation of it here isn't great. In fact, it's honestly unusable in its current form. They did make a tutorial video, but Aurora Tech's video explores it further. So there's a link here if you wanna go check it out, if, if it's a feature you really need, but it's incredibly hacky and I just wasn't interested hacking software to try to get Wi-Fi to work. The machine comes with lots of demo prints, such as this little uh, bird whistle, which I'm not gonna blow because it's really, really loud, a calibration cube, and this little tiny uh, ghost thing. Um, but I ran a lot of prints and I was really not very happy with the print accuracy. I wasn't sure if that was caused by the direct drive extruder design or the not very well designed cooling duct, but I actually then discovered that the print bed itself was a little bit loose. Whether it was like that from factory or it happened slowly due to heating and cooling cycles, I wasn't super impressed. The plastic offsets that are underneath it do appear slightly deformed, so they might not be up to the task of holding it in place with the high temperatures, but I didn't have any suitable replacements, so I just tightened everything back down in a cross pattern configuration and ran mesh bed leveling again. But unfortunately, this tiny additional bit of tightness means one screw in the back now collides with the shaft of the Y-axis stepper motor. Yeah, annoying little things. And the reason this review's taken so long is the prints I was getting off this machine were okay, but they certainly weren't great. Uh, I was using Cura and the suggested settings, and then I was trying completely custom settings, like my old uh, like stringing fix for the Ender 3. Nothing was working. So I just decided to build a Prusa Slicer profile from the ground up, and I started to get decent prints. Link in the description if you want to download that. I did find a big brim was still necessary to hold prints down, even though they're just PLA, they were lifting at times. Um, and I just, again, I don't think the surface is great and the bed heater is too gutless, but yeah, I did start to get some fairly decent prints. In particular, I actually just needed some functional prints and the machine was in the studio. So I actually printed this headphones holder out of uh, this gray PLA Plus. It's got some thick walls to make it nice and strong and sturdy, and it's really not too bad. It's definitely not the best print I've ever seen, but it's okay, it's not terrible. And in terms of clearances, I could get down to 0.3, okay, but two and 0.15 millimeter was a no-go. And I do think that's due to the poor, poor cooling due to the really inadequate duct design. So for example, with my Russian lock design, it's really evident that the, the steep overhangs just aren't very good and they do suffer due to that. But I was able to run off this Squid Game mask on this machine and I was sure it was gonna fail because there is so many retracts to do these holes. As it builds up, it retracts like hundreds of times, but it's actually really, really decent. It's a 0.4 nozzle. I printed this at 0.2 millimeter layer heights and it just came out really good for FDM. Like not the best ever, but again, really acceptable. And it actually finished, which is actually again, really impressive because there's so many retracts. Each time you retract, it's a chance for that molten plastic that's softening to actually jam your hot end and cause the print to fail, which I have seen on other machines when trying to print models like this. And with the clearance gauge failing, it's no surprise that this little sliding puzzle also failed. The parts in the middle, did, uh, I was able to wiggle them free, but the parts on the sides are all just completely welded up. And I tried 
various setting changes and that, but I do just think it's an issue with cooling and that direct drive uh, design. The Clearance Castle is my latest challenging 3D print. I just released it. You can find the video here if you're interested, but I thought I'd throw it at the Tycoon Max and unfortunately there's quite a few issues with it. Uh, to start, the drawbridge wouldn't go down. It looked like it wanted to move. The hinges seemed to be free, but it was actually welded at the connection point to the tower. And I actually broke the drawbridge trying to move it. I used a screwdriver to pry that free, but the labyrinth tower is just completely fused in place. And even using a flathead screwdriver to try to rotate it free just resulted in me destroying the bottom of the plastic. So, there is clearly room for improvement here. Kairu 3D is a relatively new company on the scene, and the Tycoon series is their first break into an incredibly competitive market segment. So here is my list of recommended improvements in Rapid Fire. The frame is fantastically rigid, but it makes no sense to build it from V-slot aluminium and not use V-rollers for at least Y and for Z. The hot end is total junk. I'm really sorry guys, but it needs a full redesign. I think a lot of these print issues are sourced from that. And the part cooling fan just is not good. It needs to all be overhauled and improved. I've seen Bowden style extruders print far better than this. The machine has this little knob at the front to manually wind filament in and out, but it has a built-in routine to do it. So when you power that up, the stepper motor gets energized and you can't turn it anyway. But the thing is the built-in routine just pulls it up slowly, which is a recipe for jams because the filament softens and as it comes up, it creates a plug and jams everything up. So what you need to do instead is extrude a little bit of filament and then quickly retract it out of the hot end because that will minimize the risk of jams greatly. The SD card slot is really finicky to use and it's easy to lose the card inside the machine. So I would make that a bit easier to use or ideally just have a USB port for a USB stick to load in G-code. And last but not least, the bed cable has an XT60 plug on it, which is great, it appears genuine, awesome, but it just drags back and forth on the table and there's not adequate strain relief. For extended use and reliability, it needs to be improved with proper strain relief and the cable management of the printer in general could do a little bit of an overhaul and some refinement. It's not bad, but that bed cable is definitely a failure point waiting to happen. Implement these improvements and this machine will very quickly become a real workhorse. And personally, I'll be doing them myself. It's a great first whack and Kairu 3D should be applauded for fully delivering on their Kickstarter because a lot of people absolutely fail to do so but it could be a lot better. However, Kairi 3D has been attentive to my feedback so far and I wish them all the best. You can find purchase links in the video description below and full disclosure, Kairi 3D sent me the Tycoon Max free of charge for purpose of review and all, all opinions are my own. If you found this review useful, then maybe consider subscribing to Maker's Muse. And if you're still on the fence on what 3D printer to buy, then maybe check out this review of the Sidewinder X2, a second generation of the large format i3 from Artillery 3D. Thanks for watching guys, bye.